Greetings. My name is Brother Satyananda. I am a monastic minister of Self-Realization Fellowship. We are here now in the main temple sanctuary of Lake Shrine. Behind me is a beautiful portrait of our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda. This portrait was taken during the dedication ceremony he conducted for Lake Shrine. He is sitting in the chair that is placed just to his side on the dais. We have now in this presentation a satsang, which is fellowship with truth, a chance for us to dive deeply into the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda as they apply to each of us in our daily lives. I hope you will enjoy it. Let us begin with a meditation, and then we will have our satsang. Please close your eyes and fold your hands. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahirdi Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, we bow to you all. O oh, beloved God, today I will take time to enjoy the beauty of nature around me. I will drink deeply from the sweetness of friendship and I will find happiness in serving those whom I love. Om Peace. Amen. For just a few minutes, let us sit in a meditation pose. Close your eyes and lift your gaze. Center yourself at the spiritual eye, the point between the eyebrows. Relax your body completely. Draw a slow, gentle, inhaling breath. Exhale and release. Now feel relaxed stillness throughout your body, heart, and mind. Feel and enjoy vibrations of peace flowing from the stillness within.
And now, with an open heart and a quiet mind, think of those whom you love in your life, someone perhaps who is very close to you, even and especially someone who is close but you have not felt close recently. Hold them close to you now. Reach out to them with your heart's love. Ask God to bless them. Feel that your love is touching their hearts. Feel that God is blessing their lives. Let us now chant home together over and over again. And as we feel the power of God's cosmic word, let us feel that we are sending out love to all of our families, all of our friends, It's so wonderful to have a little meditation before we have satsang. It is also very effective and to keep in mind that when you want to study and receive the most from scripture, it really helps to be able to have a short, even a short meditation before. And you will feel the difference you will feel your heart opening. You will feel the quietness of your mind um, receiving more that way. And then when you study the words of the master, you will feel them entering into your heart and you will understand the true meaning that he intends to convey to you. And so this is a timeless tradition from ancient times in India of meditating with the guru and then receiving the guru's teachings. So satsang, which means fellowship with truth, is a spiritual Q&A by which we're able to hear questions that are common to all truth seekers and to receive answers from the teachings of the guru that can apply directly to our daily lives. We have some interesting topics 
for these questions today. Uh, they've been posed by members of our Lake Shrine Temple over the past several years, and I've taken a few that I thought would be of particular interest. Uh, we'll be talking about the intersection between God's will and your will, that is, divine will and human will, how we can understand that. Also, questions about understanding some of our complex human emotions and how we can understand them and cope with them. Also about melancholy and sadness. Where does it come from? What is its source? And also a little bit about fantasy and daydreaming. So you see we're covering some very interesting aspects of our multifaceted state of consciousness. So let's start with a question about God's will, divine will. The question is, it is clear to me that this creation has a cosmic plan and I do believe in a divine purpose. But when I read in various scriptures about the importance of doing God's will, I become uncertain how to align my actions. How can I become actually aware of God's will? And how can I attune my decisions and actions? I chose this question because it comes up frequently in satsang. And I believe it's one that at some time or other in your life, maybe even recently, you have also asked yourself. The answer that our guru gives, and also Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita, is stunningly simple. Krishna says, O Arjuna, meditate, then, as thou wilt, act. And this is the simple formula that the enlightened ones give to us. That if we meditate, quiet the heart and the mind first, then we can choose rightly, we can choose well. We can find ourselves more in tune with God's divine will. So Paramahansa Yogananda explains, and it is found throughout his teachings, that meditation before daily action uh, prepares us for the best results. Yoganandaji says that meditation awakens a state which he calls driti, the sattvic driti state. Sattva is one of the gunas, or the highest level attribute um, of the soul. And driti is a Sanskrit word that means divine fortitude. This would be like a calm confidence, um, a freedom from doubt, anxiety, and fear, and an attunement with the divine order of the universe. This would be the state of driti, or divine fortitude. So if we meditate first, and then we decide and act, we will be reassured by a calm heart and mind. We will have a natural sense of confidence in our ability to be able to align our thoughts with the higher order of God's will. So after we have meditated, our will, our judgment, our choices, and our decisions are better aligned with the divine will of God. This is sattvic driti. Listen to Paramahansaji and what he says in his commentary on this Bhagavad Gita passage. He says, a yogi possessing a sattvic driti consciousness keeps his mind settled in the blessed perception of the soul. He can therefore move in worldly life, engaging in dutiful activities, beholding good and evil, without being in any way affected or entangled by them. 
So meditation gives us a freedom from the influence uh, of the dream maya that's going on around us. And this freedom allows us to become more receptive to the greater will of God. Now, what's factored in here and is important to consider is that God has given to you and given to me, each one of us, a gift, a gift of free will. Uh, We have the freedom to make our own choices. And this is part of God's plan. This is part of God's divine will, is our free will. So it is God's divine will and higher purpose for us to choose freely and choose righteousness. So now comes an important precept. And if we can understand this, then it will guide us in our daily decision-making. Your wisdom-guided will and God's will for you are one and the same. Your wisdom-guided human will and God's divine will for you are one and the same. Now, this is a very empowering precept, and it takes into account the full scope of God's design. God has created a higher consciousness and a higher order that we can step into. God has also given a gift of free will to either step into that higher will or not. And this is part of our personal expression of life. So whatever you choose with a loving heart and a clear conscience is in attunement with God's will. So you have the power to be in tune with and perform in harmony with God's will and to do that now. You don't have to wait for any future date or more advanced state to be able to deeply discern what is right for you in this time and space right now. So wisdom-guided will, our guru uses this term frequently throughout his teachings. Um, There's human will that is guided by desires. There's human will that's guided by anger, uh, revenge. There is human will that's guided by charity, by love, by virtue, by truth. So wisdom-guided will is what we are seeking. So let's define wisdom-guided will so we might know what that driti state feels like. You have to make a decision. It's an important decision. And you are not sure what to do because there are potentially many options. The first thing that we would normally do is to gather information. And so this is a natural first step. We do our research, we do our homework, we gather information, and we kind of gather information until we feel we have enough to be able to give our uh, decision fair consideration. And then we evaluate the information that we have. We do it with thoughtfulness, we do it with care. We weigh the factors and what seems to be the most charitable, perhaps, what seems to be the most fair. And then we sit and meditate. We meditate to clear the consciousness. We meditate to clear the heart. Because we want to feel free from anxiety, from pressures. And we want to be in attunement with um, God's higher will. So we've gathered information, we've done a little evaluation, and we've meditated, and then comes a time for deciding and choosing while trying to retain this state of calm heart and mind with noble intention. And so after you have meditated, you will feel the calmness, and that is when you can trust your thoughts, you can trust your feelings, and you use that opportunity then to make your choice. Now, we can always question our choices. We can always doubt um, ourselves. But at a time when we are calm in this driti state, 
that is a time to trust ourselves. And that is important that you take the risk and you trust yourself. You make the selection that you feel is the best that you can choose right now, knowing what you know right now, conditions, whatever they are. And then you offer the results to God. So even before you engage in actions or implementing your decision, you offer the results and you say, Lord, I have, you know, prepared myself and I feel that I'm in as much attunement as I can be with your divine will. I feel a sense of harmony in my heart about this choice. Um, guide me, bless me, I offer the results to you. So this is wisdom guided will. So even if your options are limited, even if every choice has adverse consequences, even if your preferred choice with a clear conscience is bound to make someone else unhappy, your will can still become the will of God. So your noble intentions and your clear conscience are more important than perfection itself. You even ask yourself, what if I choose and don't get it right? Well, not to worry, because as we've all heard, God watches the heart. God watches the heart. And this actually is what makes for perfection. Because a more informed decision without love in the heart is less perfect than a loving decision with little information. So your noble intentions are very important. And Paramahansaji even says that there's no perfection in this dual world of relativity. And so there's a learning curve built into the plan. As we practice this, we will become better and better, more adept. And actually we become more confident confident in the process and confident in our ability to follow it and get good results. I've been following this for a long time and you have my testimony that it works. Now, we will not only always see the results that we want right away, it takes some time for God to work. But we will see that when we apply these steps, that looking back, uh, the decision really was the best, not only for you, but often for everyone else in concerned. So when you exercise your wisdom guided free will in this way, sincerely striving to perform well, even though seemingly imperfectly, you are doing God's will for you and you are infusing your environment with righteousness. So experiment with the process. That's all that I can say. Do your homework. Evaluate results with careful intention. Meditate and pray to clear your heart and mind. Then make your choices, make your selections. Knowing what I know now with the evidence that's available to me, with an open heart that has goodwill and fairness for all, with a calmness of heart and mind and a peace within me, I feel that this choice is the best one that I can make now. Lord, I offer these results to you. Please bless me, bless everyone involved. And then move into action. If you want to increase your skill in wisdom-guided decision-making, then go back and review later. This is where I have learned so much for myself. I go back and I take a look and I say, I was a little uncertain about my direction on that decision. How did it actually work out? And I find when I follow these steps, it always works out. And I'm always happy that I made that choice, even though I wasn't certain at the time. So this is the way you can train yourself to have confidence in the process and confidence in yourself. Another question. 
As soon as I become quiet in meditation, my mind falls into memory thoughts, sometimes sweet and sentimental and other times full of painful regrets. What can I do about this? Well, you are an emotional person and you have some strong attachments to the past. But we have to keep in mind that all human emotion has one source, and that source is the soul's love for God. So even this passing sentimental emotion has its roots in divine love. And so what you can do is try a little exercise, that is try to feel the love behind the attachment, because when the sentiment comes up, it might be something that is meaningful to you. There is some kind of a strong personal emotion involved. Take that emotion and offer it to God. Say, Lord, you are the source of all my experiences. You are the source of all of my feelings. And the feelings that I have for these past memories are directly connected with my soul's love for you. Awaken in me, purify me, and awaken in me a greater love for you. In this way, we can leave experiences, especially painful ones, behind and carry forward um, the feeling of love for God. So when we offer our earthly sentiments on the altar of love for God, we accomplish actually two things. One is we purify our earthly attachments, and we also convert human sentiment into divine inspiration. And this actually is the purpose of this gift of feeling, of human feeling, is to gradually begin to purify it and lift it up so that it can become the love of God. Listen to Paramahansa Yogananda, he says, the love of God cannot be described, but it can be felt as the heart is purified and made constant. As the mind and the feeling are directed inward, you begin to feel his joy. The pleasures of the senses do not last, but the joy of God is everlasting. As the heart is purified and made constant, and so that is the action that we are taking. We are taking our natural human reactions, our sentiments, our attachments, and the feelings that belong to those attachments, and we are offering them to God. And you can offer them just as they come up. So something comes up, uh, make that connection with God. I'm feeling this loneliness because I'm missing someone who is no longer here on this earth and you take that feeling of grief and then you offer it to God. And you will find that the connection itself will bring comfort, a soothing comfort that purifies the grief. And because your heart is open with feeling, memories and sentiment, um, your heart is also open to the soul's love for God. And so then you will find yourself elevated, purified, in that new state of being. So this is satsang. I hope this is helpful. Uh, these are questions that come up. Uh, everyone is pondering oftentimes the same thing. We're all having shared experiences. And we can take a look together at the truth uh, behind these experiences through the teachings of the Satguru. And even more than that, we can uh, consider action items that we can take, strategies that we can apply to help move us along on the spiritual life. So God has given us gifts, um, gifts in the form of um, human potential. We have human experience, and the human experience is not the end of that gift. It is only the beginning. So we have human will, that can be transmuted or elevated into divine will. We have human sentiment, 
um, which can be elevated into divine inspiration. And so as we lift up our human experience, we are expanding and realizing its full potential. We can have a much more powerful and elevated experience this way. This is what the spiritual life is all about. It's taking an ordinary human life and through our own efforts of purification, turning it into a divine experience. Here's another one. I love to daydream, but I'm starting to realize how daydreaming distracts me from my spiritual goals. How can I stop this habit of daydreaming? So maybe you're a fantasy fanatic. Uh, You like fantasy dramas. You like to maybe dream about distant worlds or life that you've, a life you've never lived but thought you could live. It's obviously a form of escape, isn't it? Um, You're searching for a better world to live in. Maybe you're even searching for better friends to be with. Idle fantasy can seem very inviting and attractive at first, but ultimately, fantasy, as you are discovering, is unproductive because it's not real. But don't stop daydreaming. Just change the script. Harness your imagination to your highest aspirations. Again, we are following this pattern of lifting human experience into divine experience. So we're not saying, no, don't fantasize. We're saying, choose your fantasies carefully. Connect them with a higher reality, with a higher truth. For example, if you've read the autobiography of a yogi, you will get to chapter 43, which is the resurrection of our guru's guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar. And that chapter is a favorite of many disciples because in that chapter, Sri Yukteswar shares with Paramahansa Yogananda, Yukteswar is in a resurrected form, coming back from uh, the astral realms. And he describes to Paramahansa Yogananda uh, the beauty of the astral worlds. And he's very specific. He talks about the spaces and the places, and he talks about the lifestyle, and he talks about the experiences, and kind of wraps the reader up in a fantasy world of uh, beauty and amazement. And you have to constantly remind yourself, um, this is real, and uh, something that I too will experience. And so what you can do is you can read this chapter and you can read the descriptions of Sri Yukteswar. And then you can begin to fantasize with your mind and take yourself there. For example, Sri Yukteswar says that astral bodies of energy fly on beams of light. Oh, that's an amazing fantasy for a fanatic. So you can close your eyes and maybe you tense the body and you relax and you feel the vibrations of energy within your body and you say, oh, I have a body of pure energy. And then you visualize yourself kind of flying through space on, you know, beams of light. And as you visualize this, your heart begins to connect with the visualization because there's a reality here. The soul knows this. The soul has the memory of this kind of experience. And you will feel the truth of it as you develop it. Now, this doesn't replace meditation. We want to have meditation, and we want to go into the stillness beyond all thought and emotion. But when you have idle moments, and your mind, or your ego, let's say, wants to kind of fall into a daydream, choose a daydream with a higher script. And you'll find that your fantasies can actually propel your divine inspirations. So if we concentrate on the guru's visions of truth, they can produce incredible insights and profound new feelings. You will find throughout uh, Guruji's writings, uh, his poems, 
his uh, mystical, metaphysical meditations. He has visualizations. These visualizations are highly imaginative and they tap into our sense of fantasy. Oftentimes what he's describing, however, is something that is, is true. It's a spiritual experience that he has had himself and he's sharing it with you. And so now your fantasy is connected with truth. We can also use fantasy for self-improvement. Visualize new strengths and virtues. You might think that you don't have them, but actually the soul possesses them. And as you begin to visualize the virtue you don't have, you will find that it starts to manifest and you start to naturally identify with it and you can begin to express it more naturally. So imagination harnessed to lofty goals will enhance spiritual progress and it's far more satisfying than idle fantasy. Paramahansa Ji says, love yourself because you are a child of God with divine potentials. It is your love and concern for this potential self that inspires and inspirits unfoldment of your true soul nature. Isn't that beautiful? It's a very caring statement. He's saying, love yourself because you are the soul and you're worthy of love. And you have a cosmic potential within you that can be awakened. And what this satsang theme is saying is, start where you are right now, don't wait. Take the experiences that you have, your human experiences, and be courageous and transform them. This is the effort that we must make sooner or later. And you will find that an ordinary human life can become a sacred life. So we need to care for ourselves spiritually. Here's an email I received a while ago, and I think you'll enjoy it. Dear brother, I had a dream recently, and I want to share it with you. I was turning 51 and was not happy about it. Turning 50 was bad enough, but now to be over 50, I was totally in a foul mood. Then I had a dream one night where many people were coming to congratulate me on my birthday. I was receiving them. Then someone said to me, congratulations on your 90th birthday. I was shocked. Me, 90 years old? Then I looked into a mirror in my dream and the realization sank in that my life had passed and I was really 90 years old. And then, brother, I woke up. And now I'm so happy with my age. I'm only 51 years old. So it's all relative, isn't it? Our last question. Our last question is about a unique and mystical emotion that occurs to all of us somewhere along our spiritual journey. Let's listen to the question. I have a question about unexplainable feelings of sadness. Sometimes I seem to fall into a mood of sorrowing, but I am perplexed because there is no outward cause. It's not depression, but almost like a grieving for something that has been lost. Can you help me understand this emotion? This connects directly with one of the Beatitudes of Jesus in the Bible and a very mystical commentary uh, given by our Guru. Jesus' Beatitude says, and this will be familiar to most of you, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And in his commentary, Guruji says that Mourning is not normal human grieving over loss. That the mourning that Jesus is speaking of is a soul yearning for God. 
And so the beatitude says, blessed are they that mourn. That is, maybe you often wondered that. Why would Jesus say you're blessed if you're sad? But Jesus is saying you're blessed if you are mourning or yearning for God. Blessed are you, and you will be comforted. So there is a two-part teaching here. One is, is that mourning does occur, that is sorrow, loneliness, yearning for God does occur within the spiritual life. And it has only one resolution, and that is the comfort of God. Let us listen to Paramahansa Ji from the commentary in the Second Coming of Christ scripture. So he's commenting on this beatitude of Jesus. The pangs of sorrow suffered by the ordinary person arise from mourning the loss of human love or material possessions or the non-fulfillment of earthly hopes. Jesus was not extolling this negative state of mind. He was speaking of that divine melancholy resulting from the awakening consciousness of separation from God which creates in the soul an insatiable yearning to be reunited with the eternal beloved. Those who really mourn for God with ever-increasing zeal in meditation shall find comfort in the revelation of wisdom bliss sent to them by God. Isn't that beautiful? And it's very mystical. Let me try to interpret. So there can come And there does come to the truth seeker an unexplainable sorrowing. It occurs in a heart that is oriented spiritually toward God and especially when we are striving to cultivate a personal relationship with God. And this sorrowing, as the commentary of our guru says, is not a dark mood. It's not a selfish or self-centered depression. It's also not related to any outer condition or event. It's not connected with any recent loss. Um, But it's a loneliness and a sadness that it seems like the world cannot satisfy. So there's something beyond this world that is causing it, and you can feel that. But still it is mysterious. And our guru solves the mystery by saying, when you have this kind of a feeling, this is the soul's secret yearning, secret longing for union with God. And it comes percolating up on its own, especially if we are meditating and we are meditating, we are clearing away our, transmuting our earthly sentiments. Uh, We are opening ourselves up to a higher dimension of cosmic feeling. And this divine sentiment is an aspect of cosmic feeling. It is also a prelude to fulfillment. But there's a spiritual test here and It's because there's a natural temptation of the ego that we try to escape this. So it comes up, we don't know what it is. We can't identify it. There's nothing to um, relate to in our daily life. But nevertheless, we're used to sorrow being a negative thing and we try to escape it. And so we escape it by seeking material diversions. And so perhaps if you have felt this, you have probably experienced yourself trying to run away from it. And it will recede temporarily. So you can hide from it for a while, but it will come back. Because again and again, this is the soul itself saying, I want more, I want something more. I'm yearning for a cosmic connection that I, you know, that I have. And I want it to be fully expressed consciously. And so it keeps coming back until we finally make the, have the realization of what it is and we begin to seek fulfillment or seek consolation. 
in God. And that actually is where the highest level definition of consolation comes from. That there is this mystical yearning that can only be consoled by God. And if we can identify it and not run away from it, not try to hide from it or to mask over it with earthly pleasures or experiences, we will find ourselves growing and expanding into the comfort of God. Paramahansa Yogananda continues with his previous commentary. He says, Those whose spiritual mourning is appeased by material fulfillments will find themselves grieving again when those fragile securities are snatched away by the demands of life or death. But those who weep for God and truth, refusing to be quieted by any lesser offering, will be forever comforted in the arms of blissful divinity. Isn't this beautiful? If you've had these experiences and these feelings and didn't know what it is, now you know. If you haven't had it yet, you will, and you will understand when it comes. This, these uh, quotations of our guru can be found on page, pages 435, 435, and 36 of the second coming of Christ, if you would like to read more. There is much more on this. So I hope you have enjoyed this satsang. I hope it has been meaningful for you. I hope it hits you on different levels of you know, thought and emotion, sentiment, um, divine sorrowing, fantasy and imagination, the use of willpower, and how we can attune our will with the will of God. Contemplate these things. And I believe that you will find, as I have, that as we take our human experience, our human emotions, our human thoughts and conceptual thinking and our imagination, these gifts that have been given to us as human beings by God, we can expand their potential into a divine experience. And this is the way that we make an ordinary human life a holy life. Let us now have a short meditation together. Close your eyes and feel within your heart, within your mind, that silent abiding presence of the God who has created you and who always remains with you. Let us fold our hands and pray together. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and you, our blessed Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. O oh, beloved God, I will take time today to enjoy the beauty of nature around me. I will drink deeply from the sweetness of friendship. And I will find happiness in serving those whom I love. Om. Peace. Amen.